I want to welcome you to the Hungry Hearts Ministry Service in Jackson, Tennessee. This is our second week broadcasting from our brand new facility, and we want to welcome everybody who's watching. Those of you who watch on YouTube later, want to thank you for watching us on YouTube, and we hope that you will tell your friends and neighbors who might be interested in Hebraic things, the Sabbath, uh, the big moves of God, worship, etc., to watch us on YouTube and Ustream. We film live on Ustream at 3 o'clock every Sabbath afternoon, Central Time. Hungry Hearts Ministries is a non-denominational church that is Torah observant and spirit filled. We believe that Yeshua Messiah day to, died to pay for our sins. Therefore, we feel an obligation to quit sinning and live according to God's laws and commandments. Uh, we're also filled with the spirit and we love to worship him in it. And today we're going to talk about Shabbat. Shabbat is one of the more important things that God will ever do for us. That is, he has given us a 24-hour space of time to worship him, to commune with him, to have time with him, and also with the other members of his family, his other children. Now, today I want to talk to you about a book we wrote called Holy Time with God. In this book, I covered the Sabbath with a lot of chapters and a lot of detail and depth. I'm going to hit on a few of those verses today. This book has great chapters like the Sabbath is holy. It just what is the Sabbath? The Sabbath was made. Why you need the Sabbath. Jesus, the captain of our salvation. Another chapter is, is God really serious about the Sabbath day? Rest is overrated, and the Sabbath makes you holy. We offer in this book online for a, a simple a contribution of $9. That includes shipping and sales tax. Sales tax in Tennessee is roughly 10%. So you're getting this book for just over $6. So for a simple contribution online of $9, you can pay on PayPal. This book is available on our ministry website, HungryHeartsMinistryWithAY.com. Just go to the store and look up Holy Time with God. Very good book on the Sabbath. Going to cover a lot of those things today. I also want to offer you our magazine, Pursuit. We put this out quarterly. It is no charge. You can email me at HungryHeartsMIN at AOL, and I will mail you this magazine for free. You can also order it on the, online on the website. Uh, there is a, a copy on the website that's a, in a downloadable PDF form, but if you would like to have this in your hands every quarter, I will be happy to mail it to you. All I need is your mailing address. I'm going to start today in Genesis the Sabbath is a created thing. The Sabbath is something that God did for all of us. And the first mention of it is in Genesis chapter 2. God created all the heavens and the earth, made everything perfect. The Hebrew is uh, denotes a connotation of a perfect creation with everything exactly the way it was supposed to be. Everything good working order, no faults, no problems, no decay. And of course, we do not find the universe in that circumstance right now. We find the universe in a process of decay. We call that entropy and enthalpy in, in chemistry and physics to designate the decay of both matter and energy in this system. The Hebrew, however, does not say that it was created that way. It was initially created without entropy and without enthalpy. Everything was not in a state of decay and falling to the lowest state. It was in a state of perfection and harmony. We're going to start in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 2. By the seventh day, God finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. So here God, for six days, has been creating things. Things. And now on the seventh day, he is going to create something that is not a tangible thing, but is an intangible thing. He didn't quit creating on the seventh day. He just created something different. And this thing that he created, he created by resting. Mm -hmm. He created this day by resting. He didn't create this day by working. You see, when he made Adam on the sixth day, he actually formed up a mud image of Adam and breathed into it the breath of life. I've always wondered if he didn't do it a piece at a time. Hmm. You know, it's easy to say he could have just formed up a, a mud log and stuck a couple of eyes in there and a couple of holes, for, holes for a nose and kind of carved a little mouth out and then blew into it and it came to life. I mean, that may be how he did it. But then I always wonder sometimes if he didn't make all the intricate little pieces and parts. Each bone out of mud, each sinew out of mud, each organ out of mud, and then build him in mud it would take him a little bit of time, maybe, you know, and then blew into him. I mean, it's just things you think about, right? 
And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating he had done. So the holiness that he put into the day also went into the day by resting. This is going to be very important when we wrap this message up in the book of Hebrews because you see we're encouraged in that book to enter into his rest. And again, for more information, I want to offer you our book, Holy Time. You can order this online, or you can just send us a $9 contribution to P.O. Box 10334, Jackson, Tennessee, 38308, and we will send this right out to you. Very good book. covers all of these in a lot more depth than I'm going to today. But I wanted to emphasize to you the fact that God created the Sabbath by resting. He makes this by resting. And later when we get into the book of Hebrews, I'm going to show you that you have to enter into it by resting. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of times people want to know, how can you possibly say, Pastor Bill, that the Saturday Sabbath that you're keeping in modern America in 2017 is the very same one that God created in Genesis chapter 2? And that's a fair question. There's a lot of time that's gone on since then, amen? A lot of things have happened, a lot of turmoil, upheaval. Let's go to Exodus chapter 16. The Sabbath did indeed become lost. The children of Israel were enslaved in Egypt, and Egypt had a 10-day week. So you work 10 days, had one day off. You work 10 days, you had one day off. That's how the Egyptian system worked. And so for the hundred and some odd years uh, that they were actually in slavery, that they lost track of the time by not keeping a seven-day week. God gave a seven-day week in creation. We have resumed that because of the Judeo-Christian values we adhere to by living by this Bible, but the Egyptians did not do that. And some people don't bother writing me and tell me the, Egyptians, the Israelites were in Egypt 400 years. That 400 years is not just a time of slavery. It's counted from the time that Abraham went down to Egypt with Sarai to the time they came out of Egypt. So it doesn't cover all of their time in slavery. Their time in slavery was a lot shorter. As a matter of fact, if you go and look it up, I think you can only count about three generations between Levi and Moses. So it tells you it's a lot shorter of a time. We know that Levi was one of the 70 souls who went to Egypt. Amen. But you can get more information if you look up a video. It's called The Patterns of Evidence by David Rowe. And uh, that carries a lot of information to give you all the missing details I'm not going to cover. But now they're, they're coming out of, of Egypt. They're wandering in the desert. Exodus chapter 16 is the giving of the manna. So these people are complaining to Moses, you brought us out to the desert to die, there's no food out here, there's no water out here, nothing but snakes and scorpions and blistering heat. And that is true. If you go look up this place in geography, you will find out that there's nothing there but scorpions, snakes, and blistering heat. So God says, I'm going to rain down bread, but notice that when he rains down the bread in Exodus chapter 16, that he gives them one day supply every day but the sixth day. Mm -hmm. And on the sixth day, he tells them, I'm going to give you twice as much, gather twice as much. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so down here in, in verse 15, it says, The Israelites saw it, and they said to each other, What is it? For we don't know what it is. Moses said to them, it's the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Each one of you is to gather as much as he needs. You're to take an omer, or roughly a quart in today's measurement, for each person you have in your tent. So you gather up as much as you need. He who gathered little didn't have any lack, and he who gathered much didn't have any left. But he also told them not to save any of it in the morning. Verse 19, no one's to keep any of it until morning. However, some paid no attention. Sounds like modern church people to me. Paid no attention, kept it up in the, in the, in the camp. We're going to have it for breakfast. I'll have me a little snack before I go gather more. And it bred worms and stank. So it was gross. You get up in the morning and it's like it's six days old. It's nasty already. It's putrid. But he said, don't save it up. I want you to gather it every day. It's a daily deal. Get up every morning, go out and gather your manna. Just imagine some of those Israelites without coffee having to get up in the morning. <laughs> Every morning, everyone gathers as much as he needed. When the sun grew hot, it melted away. Now, on the sixth day, they were to gather twice as much. So instead of gathering one quart per person, you were to gather two quarts per person, and you were to save it overnight. Now, I can just imagine that the same people who refused to listen the first time were the same people who refused to get enough the second time. That's usually the way it works, right? 
I tried to save it up and it stank. I ain't buying that on the sixth day. Yeah, sure you can tell me that, but I already did that. That didn't work out. So guess what? They went hungry on Shabbat and learned how to fast. <laughs> but they gathered it up. Now, look at here. That in verse 27, nevertheless, some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather it. You know those were the ones who saved it and it, it, it didn't work out, right? You, know, you see this all happening in your mind, right? God wasn't happy. God was not happy. And then the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments? It's not happy. But it's the same word used as the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. But he hasn't given them yet. Oh. You think maybe they had them in oral form before they got them in written form? Mm -hmm. And you suppose that maybe they should have already known? Because Abraham kept all those, even though it had, it, we, we still four chapters away from getting this, right? Mm -hmm. Chapter 20, when you get it, we're in chapter 16. But Abraham did it back in Genesis. So somewhere they had an oral form of this. He says, bear in mind that the Lord has given you Shabbat. He's given you the Sabbath. He's resetting the time. Six days of manna, none on Shabbat. Six days of manna, none on Shabbat. You think after 40 years they kind of figured out what day Shabbat was? Six days of manna, none on Shabbat. Six days of manna, none on Shabbat. Now, I know it takes a little repetition to get the average human to remember something, but I can imagine that your daily food tied to this cycle of six days manna, none on Shabbat for 40 years, you think maybe they kind of got the idea that Saturday was the Sabbath? Yeah. After 40 years? He didn't let them have any grain. Oh, come on, somebody. He didn't let them have any extra food. They had to eat manna for 40 years until they figured out that Saturday was the Sabbath. I wonder if that work in modern America. You know, I, we kind of bullheaded here in America. I'm not so sure 40 years to get the job done over here. Amen? So Saturday is the Sabbath, and it's been reset. And the Jewish people have kept the Sabbath intact. Even when they broke it. You see, you know, you go back to the division of the, of the two kingdoms of Israel into Israel and Judah. And Israel changes the day to Sunday and goes into captivity. <laughs> Judah keeps the Sabbath, doesn't always keep it, but they go into captivity. And you see, they preserved it even when they didn't keep it. Mm -hmm. But the northern tribe ditched it right off the bat and lost the whole program. Hmm. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. So we know today that the day we're keeping this Saturday is the Sabbath. Now, in, in Jewish thought, Hebrew thought, the days are numbered. The only day with a name is Shabbat. Mm -hmm. In our thought, which comes out of pagan uh, Roman uh, uh, practice, it's called Saturday after Saturn. But the Jews were keeping Saturn Day as the Sabbath for a long time in Roman history. As a matter of fact, I was talking to one of a great archaeologist by the name of Richard Reeves, and in his book, uh, Too Long in the Sun, he talks about how the entire Roman world kept Saturday as a Sabbath. Mm -hmm. A lot of folks don't realize that. The whole world was keeping Shabbat at one point in time. It was only when the little horn of Daniel chapter 7, which we talked about in court this morning, rose up and spoke boastful words against the Most High God did they change the day to Sunday and enforce it on pain of death. But in the ancient Roman times, Saturday was a Sabbath day in addition to uh, what they did on Sunday. Now, I want to talk to you about Sabbath, and I want to get into the New Testament now. And we're going to switch to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. <clears throat> you know, you used to say all the time a few years ago, WWJD, what would Jesus do? And I'm going to tell you, we can look in the, in the Bible record and see what Jesus did. Jesus kept the Sabbath. He kept Shabbat every week, rain, sun, or shine all the time. At no point did Jesus ever change the day of worship <coughs> Excuse me, from Saturday to Sunday. At no point. He kept every Sabbath. <coughs> Excuse me. He kept them flawlessly. And I said, for more information, <clears throat> I want to offer you this book, Holy Time with God. <clears throat> you can call or write. <clears throat> oh, excuse me, it's a allergy season in the South. <clears throat> it stays allergy season in the South. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> Get that 
one tickle and it won't go away. <coughs> Uh, those of us who live here know. <coughs> yep. mm -hmm. uh, Matthew, I mean, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 2, uh, verse 25. <coughs> oh, excuse me. We'll take it verse 23. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields. <coughs> His disciples walked along and began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisee said to him, Look, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? <clears throat> now, if these men were truly harvesting grain <clears throat> for resale <clears throat> or picking food for groceries, that might have been the case. But what these men were doing was grabbing handfuls for a snack on their way into service. Mm -hmm. It is perfectly legal on the Sabbath to get a snack on the way into church. Amen. Amen. Now, the Pharisees had made a law, a written oral law, <clears throat> that you could not put out any effort on the Sabbath day. But let me just explain something to you about these Pharisees. These same people that are accusing the disciples of breaking the Sabbath for grabbing a few handfuls of grain are the same ones that had their servants actually working for them on the Sabbath mm -hmm. and bringing their food and setting it in the window in the wall. <clears throat> And as long as they didn't come into the room where they were sitting, it was all great. Oh, see, you find things out, you do a little historical work. So Jesus said, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for the priest to eat, and he gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made. <clears throat> the Sabbath is a created thing. Mm -hmm. It was made. And he said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. You see, the Sabbath is made for us to have that time with God. The Sabbath is made for us to get that time and rest. So people put all kinds of, of legalistic and man-made rules on the Sabbath. But these do not exist in the Scripture. Right. Okay, well, if that's your preference, that's great, but just don't tell me I have to do it because I'm only going to follow the rules that are written in this book. And if this book doesn't say it's, it's wrong to do it, then I'm doing it if it's that's what's good for today. Look, I had someone argue with me I couldn't buy gas on the Sabbath. I said, what, I'm going to drive over here to Cookville and just stay till sundown so to please you that I don't have to buy gas on the way home? <clears throat> that's not what's going to happen. I'm going to buy gas and I'm headed where I'm headed. You know, typically we get together with the folks in Murfreesboro on the way home from Cookville, and I'm buying gas before I go eat dinner because I don't want to try to do that at midnight when I'm coming home. Oh, come on, somebody, I'll get that in a minute. So you see, people want to make all these man-made rules to make the Sabbath difficult, but those are not actually found in the Bible. The Sabbath was made for us to enjoy, it was made to be a blessing, and it was made to be good, and it was made for us to grow closer to God and closer to each other as brethren. So the Sabbath was made, and who do you think did the making? Jesus. The same account in Matthew, Jesus calls himself the Lord of the Sabbath. Now, I don't know who your Lord is, but I know my Lord is the Lord of the Sabbath. He created the Sabbath. He made the Sabbath. He puts his presence in the Sabbath. He made the Sabbath holy, and he's the one who is consecrating me by observing it. Oh, come on, somebody. That's good stuff right there. Yeah. Now, how often can you have anything to consecrate you in this life? But here, observing the Saturday Sabbath will consecrate you and make you holy because you're living in an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Well, oh, that's pretty good stuff, y'all. <clears throat> now, for those of you on Ustream, we'll offer you our, our um, Feast of Tabernacles album uh, for 2017. This has all the great messages that we had during this feast in October. It's a DVD set's only $95 and the CD set is only $45. These are some tremendous messages including the powers of the kingdom of God, the gospel of the kingdom of God, moving in the spirit. Are we in the last days, number one? Are we in the last days, number two? Star power in a jar of clay and Holy Spirit firepower. Really tremendous action-packed Feast of Tabernacles. Wish you could have been there. Uh, you can always come next year, but you can capture uh, your share of the message and the anointing for a contribution of $95. <clears throat> this is available on the website. And uh, you can buy it uh, through PayPal. Now I want to go to Hebrews chapter 4.
know, I have a subtitle in mind for Hebrews chapter 4 says, A Sabbath Rest for the People of God. There is a Sabbath rest for the people of God. So for you out there in TV land, you're the people of God. There's a Sabbath rest for you. And a lot of people want to try to explain this away. If you don't rest on the Sabbath, if you don't enter into his rest on the Sabbath, then you can't have the Sabbath rest of God. You can't do this at work. You can't do this while you're cutting the grass around the house or raking the leaves here in the fall time. You have to stop your labor. <clears throat> and you have to enter into his rest. Preferably, you go to church services somewhere, and there are a number of Sabbath-keeping churches around the country. Hopefully, you're in church services so that you have the fellowship of the brethren, the move of the Holy Spirit. Hopefully, it's one that worships. Amen? Uh, speaking of that, I want to give a great shout-out to all my Kansas ladies who are having home church right now and watching us live on Ustream. I want to thank you ladies for watching. We really appreciate the fact that you support us the way you do, and we really wish you were here today because we have the long cars in the house. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully you'll get down here in a few months and we can see you again. So Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands... So here is a New Testament writer prior to the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem who's saying that the promise of entering that rest still stands. That means there are a people out there in the future from him, or maybe in his time, who have a promise of being able to enter into the Sabbath rest of God and achieving that complete unity or that complete echad with the Holy God of Israel. That previous people did not enter this because they didn't believe. He says, therefore, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. So many people have fallen short of entering into the Sabbath rest of God. For we also have had the gospel preached to us just as they did. So he's saying that they had a gospel message of the kingdom of God preached to them. And if you want to go back and do your history in, in, in Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and Leviticus, you'll find out that God told them he wanted them to be a kingdom of priests. God told them he wanted them to set up the kingdom of God on earth in the, in, the, in the commonwealth of Israel. Commonwealth because it was all 13 tribes living together without a king. He, did, he wanted to be their king. He did not want them to have a human king. So in their commonwealth, they were to mimic and replicate the soon coming kingdom of God. See, when Jesus comes back, he'll be king. Amen? He'll be king. <clears throat> and there will be a commonwealth of Israel, and all the nations of the earth will answer to one tribe or another in that commonwealth. He's saying they had this gospel message preached to them. They understood what they were supposed to do at the time, but they didn't believe. So they looked at the nations around them. What are they doing? Let's be like them. But they lived in a time of extreme idolatry and paganism. <clears throat> So he said, but the message they heard was of no value because those who heard it did not combine it with faith. They didn't have the faith to believe that they could live in the kingdom of God. So he's looking at us right now in modern America and he's asking, do you have the faith to believe that you can live in the kingdom of God or your piece of it or the piece of it that you can create in your life while you live in this world? See, it, it, <clears throat> and John, he said, I, I, I'm not praying, Father, that I take them out of the world because I'm expecting each one of them to be a little a little member of the kingdom of God in Satan's world. So you see, we all want to go off somewhere else to be the kingdom of God away from Satan's world. And the, and the Lord is telling us, I want you to be a little piece of the kingdom of God in the devil's world, jacking his kingdom up and, Come on, tell that. Yeah. and wrecking what the devil is doing. And the more each one of us is that great citizen of the kingdom of God, in Satan's realm, it is shaking him to the foundations. Now, we who have believed enter that rest. Do you believe that Jesus died for your sins? Do you believe that he is your Savior? Do you believe in the kingdom of God? Then you enter into that rest on Shabbat. You enter into the rest. <clears throat> you can't do that if you're going to go to work. Right. You can't do that at work. Nope. You can't do that when you're tending properties. You can't do that when you're cutting the grass. You can't look. It's, look, it's okay to wash a Sabbath day's dishes, but don't wash your dishes for the week. Amen. Amen. I mean, you eat food on Shabbat. You got to clean up after, but just don't clean it. Don't carry the. If you carry the week's mess into Shabbat, you leave it right there in the sink. Amen. 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 You wash it when sundown comes. Right. But if, if you you got coffee this morning, you can wash your cup and put it away. It's okay. <laughs> 
We make the Sabbath hard. God made the Sabbath easy. Amen. And he keeps coming back to make it easier and easier for us. But for some reason, we got to have it all complicated. We'd rather have 40 little man-made rules and do's and don'ts and do it this way and don't do it that way and turn left and do three circles. I mean, <laughs> he didn't say all that. <clears throat> he said, do no servile work. So don't do any servile work. But he also said, come to church in this, in this very book. <coughs> Now we who have believed into that rest, just as God had said, so I declared on my oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. So there was a people, he closed it off. They couldn't enter the rest. And yet his work has been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. On the seventh day God rested from all his work. So here this writer is not saying that you're going to have a Sabbath rest in Christ. He's tying you right down to the Sabbath day itself. Your Sabbath rest in Christ comes from keeping the seventh day. <clears throat> and again in the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. It remains that some will enter that rest, and those who formerly had the gospel preached to them did not go in because of their disobedience. So God said again a certain day, calling it today, when a long time later he spoke through David, as was said before, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. So I'm asking you right now, today if you hear his voice, today if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm telling you, and asking you and begging you to enter into the Sabbath rest of God on the seventh day. If you've never done it in your life, make whatever provision you have to to stop your labors on Friday night sundown until Saturday night sundown and you give God today. If you're all by yourself and you have no church, just go to God in prayer, get the Bible out, put, spend some time in the Word, learning directly from God, and He will show up and tend to you on His Sabbath day Amen. because that's who He is and it is what He does. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> For Joshua had given them rest. God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work just as God did from his. This is a highly spiritual thing to enter into the rest of God, the Sabbath rest of God, and you can only do it in a spiritual way. However, if you work, you have broken all connection to the spiritual, and if you do physical work on that day, not counting serving at church, then you cannot have your connection with God. You broke it by working. So don't break it by working. Right. Again, for more information... On this subject, I want to offer you this book, Holy Time with God. You can email me at HungryHeartsMIN at AOL.com. You can write us at Post Office Box 10334, Jackson, Tennessee, 38308. Contribution of $9 is all. You can get it on the ministry website for that contribution, and you can use PayPal. Also want to offer you our free magazine, Pursuit. has all kind of wonderful articles in it about uh, godly subjects. And it also shows you that we are on Ustream Live at 3 p.m. So we hope that you continue watching, and we hope that you order our, our literature. But this Sabbath rest, they fell short by disobeying. And one of the ways you disobey is to work on Shabbat. When you work on the Sabbath, you break your connection. They fell in the desert because of that. And so right now, God is calling out to American Christians, step up and keep my Sabbath day and keep it holy. I want to close by going to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, chapter 3. A lot of people have a problem with the Old Testament. I don't know why they have a problem with the Old Testament. I kind of like the Old Testament. It's the first two-thirds of your Bible. It is extremely difficult to understand what's in the last third of your Bible in the New Testament when you don't understand what's in the first two-thirds of your Bible, the Old Testament. Amen. 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 I mean, how many of you read novels by going to the back of the book, reading the last chapter, and, and walking away? That doesn't work that way. There's a story involved here. How many of you watch your movies by just dropping in the last five minutes? You just watch the whole, you didn't watch the rest of the movie, you just drop in the last five minutes and just check it out. <clears throat> Some people just want to see the climax at the close, right? It's the action scene at the end. The rest of the story didn't really matter. All right, here you go. But that's kind of what we do with the Bible. We want to jump around in the back part of the Bible, and we want to look at these verses in terms of modern American life. This book was not written to modern Americans. This book was written by Jews, for Jews, to Jews. Amen. <clears throat> All of whom are observant Jews. 
And they're explaining that the Mashiach has come to pay for the transgressions of Torah. And they're saying that you can never keep Torah perfectly enough because you already broke it. Well, that shouldn't require a lot of explanation, amen? The first time we transgress any one of God's laws and commandments, we're guilty and it requires the sacrifice of Jesus to avoid the lake of fire. This is that simple. So once you come to Jesus, how do you prove your righteousness by how well you live when you already proved you're not able to do it? See, but we think like that. And then other people who don't like the Jews for some reason, I still have figured that out, met the Jewish temple for 21 years. They were absolutely fantastic folks. They treated us wonderfully. They're still my dear friends. And so I don't understand why people don't like them, but for some reason they will say, oh, you're trying to have salvation by works like the Jews. Well, I've been to their service, and they don't believe in salvation by works. So I don't know where we got that myth about them, but that just isn't true. <clears throat> I've been there and done that. So 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13. We are not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. So Moses was in the presence of God. He soaked up all of that great God presence. When he comes down, he's glowing in the dark. They're freaking out. So he's having to put a veil over his face because they're freaking out. He's glowing in the dark. <laughs> But their, I'm sorry, over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day when the old covenant is read, it has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. He's saying that there's a veil over people's face regarding the Old Testament, and that they can't understand the Old Testament, because there's a veil over their face preventing them from understanding it. And the only way you can understand the Old Testament is when you accept Jesus as your Messiah, the veil gets taken away and you can see. Yes. So how is it in 2017 that so many Christians walk around this country with a veil on their face to the Old Testament when he said that Christ is taken away? That don't make good sense. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. <clears throat> so how is it that all these people in, in churches all across America, major denominational churches, they have a veil over their hearts and minds when it concerns the Old Testament? Because when you come to Christ, the veil goes. So how come you can't see what's written in there and understand it and follow it? How can anyone tell you that the law is done away, Torah is done away, Christ did away with it, you can eat whatever you want to, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> I would just recommend you try that with your car. <laughs> and you make sure your car tells you to put unleaded gas in there, right? Just pull up to the diesel pump and load it up because you don't have to follow that law. That law is done away. You can put whatever you want in your mouth, so put whatever you want in your gas tank. Put some diesel in there. Go ahead. See how far you get. How <clears> far <throat> I know a man that accidentally put diesel in his car one time. He wasn't paying any attention, even though it didn't fit and all the things didn't work out. He just, for some reason, was preoccupied with something else. He made it work. He filled that gas tank full of diesel, and it won't even start after that. Done. Tow the car. The entire fuel system has to be removed. The gas tank has to be steam cleaned. Most of the parts inside got to be replaced. It takes forever to get enough gas in that engine to make it fire again. But he did it. And he walked away to tell about it. But see, when you put stuff in your mouth that God says it doesn't go in your tank, right. you wonder why 40 years later you got heart disease and arthritis. I don't wonder. You put that junk in, you're going to get a bad result out. Right. Just because it starts and you walk away from the pump doesn't mean that it was okay. See, with the car, it's immediate. We can see the results. But with the food in your face, it's not immediate because God gave you some grace. But we got to quit using grace for stupid. <laughs> because if God said it don't go in the tank, it don't go in the tank. Amen? Amen. Now you can be stupid about it for a while, but it's going to catch up to you eventually. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Just look at all the southerners you know with heart disease in their 50s. We're not designed to die in our 50s. We're designed to die in our 90s. So how come all the southerners die in their 50s? Somebody get that in a minute. Come on. Come on. <laughs> I don't have that book here to, to show you, but we have a book on the dietary laws written by Kelly McDonald, and it's a little bit more money, but you can get it on the website, and it is called um, <clears throat> Clean and Unclean, The Guide to Living the Holy Life, and it's available on the website, HungryHeartsMinistry with a Y.com. 
small fee. Again, all of our books are postage paid and, and we, we cover the sales tax. So you can knock off about three to four dollars on every one of those. This little book right here costs two bucks to mail. <clears throat> so every time that you buy something, it's postage free. So your cost is the full cost. So if you're not going to order a book from us for $7 and then it's going to have all these add-ons. There'll be no add-ons. The price is the price. That's the price and we send it right out. So I want to offer you that today because you should recognize or be able to recognize from reading your Bible that the Saturday Sabbath is the Sabbath. It's what God intended from the beginning. It's what he intended with Adam and Eve. <clears throat> when it says he makes the day holy, it means he has poured his spirit into that day and it is intense. We cover every one of those things in this book. We have a wide variety of chapters. I think there's like 10 chapters in here, including how to keep the Sabbath. And uh, we have also included our little Arab Shabbat service. But uh, as you can see, we have a lot of stuff in this book. I like to keep them brief. I like to keep them easy reading so that you can pick it up and read it without any complications or distress. I like simple. Amen. Amen. Life's hard enough. We like simple. Very simple primer on the Sabbath, and then you will be able to quickly assimilate yourself into Sabbath life. I want to thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. hope you'll tell your friends. Go visit our website, and we hope to see you again next week.